So before I uh, begin stuff, I want to point out for a conference like this, for it to be successful, you need good people, good mathematics, and good organization. And, uh, and here we had five local organizers, Greg Friedman, uh, Eric Hansen, Scott Mallet, Efton Park, and Jose Carrion. And uh, they did a fabulous job to actually make all this possible and actually work and function. And so, so Eric and uh, Greg, please stand up and, and, and let us uh, give you sort of a round of applause. Not only that, they're the ones that wrote the grant that got you the money to make it possible for you to come here. So, so we owe them a great debt of thanks. So today, uh, so also one other actually comment is that uh, the new versions of my lectures, basically as I went over the lectures this week, I of course found some typos and uh, slight things wrong. So they're actually new versions that I've done. I sent them to Greg and he's gonna be putting, somehow he's sort of busy today, but uh, uh, he's gonna put them on the website sometime between now and Monday. So on Monday you'll have you know, pretty close to uh, final versions of the, of the slides. And the plan for today is I'm going to talk about basically uh, you know, chemical reaction networks. And so I'll do some of the classical theory in the first hour. In the second hour, I'll do toric dynamical systems. And, uh, and then uh, in the third hour, Alicia will sort of, uh, sort of bring us up to date on things. And then we'll have the problem session this afternoon. And uh, it looks like we still have a couple of slots available on the problem session. And, and, and so, uh, so basically, if, if you're inspired to do something, you know, feel free to add your name to that. So several people asked us not to record the problem session, so there won't be any records kept. So you shouldn't feel uh, embarrassed about getting up and being in front of the camera. So what, what, what happens in this room stays in this room. That's right. <laughs> it's work in progress, half-baked aspirations. Hey, They're all fair box. game. <laughs> OK, so today. I want to talk about uh, chemical reaction uh, networks. And those are the plan for the morning. Oh, I have to turn it on. Plan for the morning is uh, basically just to talk about some of the very uh, classical stuff. So we have to talk about the law of mass action. We have to learn some of the lingo, uh, species, complexes. There can be some nice directed graphs. We have to learn about some st what stoichiometry means and uh, talk about uh, steady state solutions, a tiny bit about multi-stationarity, and then just learn a tiny bit about some of the people involved in creating this uh, theory. And then the second part will be a particular class that are called complex balance networks. And so there we're going to learn about uh, you know, linkage classes, weak reversibility, and one of the sort of uh, early and very wonderful results of the theory was is the zero deficiency theor theorem. So we will end up on that today. So to get started, let's talk about a chemical reaction. So we have these nice elements over here. You know, so, so there's uh, nitrogen, there's oxygen. And so these guys can interact. In the atmosphere, most oxygen lives in molecules O2. That's uh, and nitrogen oxide. And the point is, is that two molecules of this in oxygen can combine to create some NO2 or N2O. And so, uh, no, it's NO2. And, um, and, and what happens is we keep track of the, there's the brackets involve what are called the concentrations. And so the idea of this would be roughly, the, uh, but naively, it's the number of molecules in a cubic centimeter. Although chemists don't use those units, they use something more intrinsic uh, based on moles and Avogadro's number and stuff like that. But I'll just think uh, very naively in just how many molecules in a cubic centimeter. The point is, these are functions of time because as this reaction proceeds, you know, you'll have uh, less of that and more of that. And the law of mass action, basically, in this situation says, when I look at how much of this, you know, what's the rate of change of the product, it's basically given by this. And of course, since the product's being created, it's a positive rate of change. But where do all these things come from? And so that's basically the idea is that when you think, you know, this reaction requires a collision of uh, two of the NOs and, and one of the O2s. And this is roughly how many possible collisions there are. And then the, uh, the kappa, the rate constant, basically says, you know, how many of these potential uh, collisions actually occur in a given time frame? And, and also, how fast is the reaction? 
and then, so that's the rate constant. And then the, uh, the, the two on the right-hand side of the reaction, so on, on the reaction, basically, you know, we have to preserve the number of nitrogen and oxygen atoms. You know, over here, we'll have a certain number. You know, here we sort of might have one, two, three, four oxygen atoms. Over here, we better have four oxygen atoms. We have two nitrogen, we have two nitrogen. So that two is keeping track of that. And we'll see that that's part of the stoichiometry uh, when we get on. And then, and then what happens is that this gives the two on the right-hand side of the differential equation, because basically any time this reaction occurs, it gives us not one of these NO2s, it gives us two of them, so that two becomes that two. So that's sort of the law of mass action um, in this particular case. And of course, when you write down the full system, you know, you actually have, you know, the concentration of that, the concentration of that, you actually get the full system of ODEs. And the point is that, uh, you know, and of course I have negative signs right here because I'm losing stuff, but the point is every triple uh, collision uh, basically ends up removing two of the NO, so that's why there's a two there, but only one O2, so that's why it's only a single minus there. So that's the system of uh, ODEs that we get. But of course I lied, because in the real world, it's basically, if you think about are two of these uh, molecules in one of those, can you have three things meet simultaneously at the same time in the same place? That's just not going to happen. And so the question is, what's really going on? And the answer is uh, that this is going to be the result of simpler reactions. And so here's a, here's a proposed mechanism for how this can, can happen. So it turns out an elementary reaction is one that involves at most two molecules. Because you can imagine two guys bumping into each other. And so that actually is something that can happen in the real world. So we want to take this system right here and turn it into some elementary reactions. And here's one of the uh, proposed mechanisms. And uh, so the idea is that two of these guys basically turn into N2O2. <laughs> But this is a reversible reaction. So you know these guys bump into each other, form that. But then this guy's sort of unstable. So after a while, it decomposes back into that. So this is a reversible reaction. And also, it, it, it's fast, whereas this is slightly slower. And of course, you know, I mean, the whole reaction, of course, is very fast. But you know, compared to uh, you know this one, this guy's much slower. And basically, where one of these now bumps into an O2 to give us the desired product. So when you put these two together, we get this. And part of the reason is that what happens is this fast reaction actually, uh, what they think is that this react reaches a steady state very quickly. And we see that in steady state, you get this. And I'll actually explain this in more detail when we talk about steady state. <coughs> So the fact that this guy's in a steady state says that you know, these two rate constants and the concentrations are like this. And then the second slower reaction gives us, so this one right here gives us that by the law of mass action, now just for this elementary reaction. But here's our N, N2O2, that's that. And if I solve for that in terms of this stuff, I get that it's actually going to be the N, this concentration squared, but the new rate constant is built from these. But see, there's the differential equation that we wrote down. But you see, it's built from the rate constants uh, of these, assuming that this fast one reaches equilibrium very quickly. Now, what's interesting is I call this a proposed mechanism. They can't prove it scientifically because it happens too fast. So you can't just isolate on and what's going on. So they think this is what happens, mainly because this is sort of the simplest explanation they could come up with. But they, they you know, again, they don't regard this as any way uh, sort of a proof from sort of what their standards are. So what happens is when we write, you know, something like, you know, if we have a reaction like this and do that in the law of mass action, it's really a convenient fiction that hides a more complicated reality. But it, it's for our purposes, it's good enough. So I'm gonna, we're gonna take stuff like this and write that without, uh, you know, uh, worrying about you know the more complicated stuff that's actually underneath the hood. And that's the usual thing that you know we when we talk about the mathematics of things, we're talking about models. The reality is usually more complicated than model. And this is a simple example of that. Now, the terminology in this reaction is that basically this reaction has two sides. And each side 
a reaction we call a complex. So, so you know, this whole bunch of stuff is a complex, and this whole bunch of stuff is a complex. But then the individual molecules that sort of uh, occur in these complexes are called species. And so, roughly speaking, you know, every complex is going to be sort of a, 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 a non-negative linear combination of the uh, species. And then what happens is that for the species, uh, I, we're going to represent its concentration by a variable. And I often use x's for the uh, co you know, spe uh, species concentrations. And then uh, for each complex, as I said, that basically each complex is built out of certain species. And it's going to be basically a, a, a non-negative linear combination of them. And so here's y1 is the vector that, because remember, I have these three guys. And the way I build this one is you know, I take 2 times that, 1 times that, and 0 times that. And of course, here, I just take 2 times the last one. So that's the 0, 0, 2. And then, for example, this was the guy that was occurring in the law of mass action. And in our variables, it's x1 squared x2, or in the exponent notation, or it's just x to the y1. And so this, this variable right here, that, or this vector right here, simultaneously tells us how to build the complex out of the species. And it's also you know, the exponent vector in the law of mass action. And so that's actually really nice, because uh, that, that makes it really easy to sort of look at the system and sort of write down what, what the uh, differential equations are. So here's our full system that we had. And we're going to write this in various different ways. And I'm going to take a while before I get to the full-blown uh, notation for it. So here's sort of what we're going to do. It's one way we're going to talk about this. When we take this guy right here, and uh, you know, I'm just going to write this you know, and put this you know, in sort of a column vector form. And then notice that what I have right here is uh, Basically, I have kappa times x1 squared times x2, so I have that. And then here I have, and then it's multiplied by the vector minus 2, minus 1, 2, which is just the difference of our y vectors. And so this is one way in which we're going to do it. And also, there's a directed graph because I, you know, from this complex to that complex, so, so basically the vertices are the complexes, and then in this case, we just have one reaction. And so that gives us a directed graph. Now, I'm going to work out one more example uh, in detail. And this is one that's, uh, I saw this in the literature called T cell signal transduction. And so you could write it down as a bunch of reactions this way. But if you sort of put it like this, you actually see the directed graph much more visibly. So we really have three complexes. And, uh, and, uh, and so I've labeled them, you know, one, two, three, and then, and so, and that explains the um, sort of indices because this uh, re this is the reaction from complex one to complex two. Here I have the reaction from complex two back to complex one, and then you know here I go from two to three and three to one. So in, in writing, so I will probably most often write the uh, 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 you know in network the, the chemical reaction networks in this directed graph form, so you see the directed graph immediately. So here we have four reactions, four species in blue, three complexes in red, all you know, supported on this directed graph. So that's sort of the, the data structure of, a, uh, of one of these chemical reaction networks. And, uh, and then in this situation, uh, of course, you know, besides that data structure, remember we also we build each complex uh, from the species, because we have four species, A, B, C, D. So our variables are x1 through x4. And then, you know, you know, the, like, you know, we build, you know, this complex, the first complex. So the subscript here refers to the complex. The first complex is built from just the first two, so A plus B. The second one is just C. The third, uh, third one is just D. So those are our uh, vectors. And then if you were to sort of write out the full uh, system using the law of mass action, you get this. And of course, in terms of, you know, because, you know, like right here, you know, going this way, you know, when I have this reaction, you know, basically I'm losing uh, stuff from x1 through this reaction. And then, and, you know, and, you know, so that, that's the product that occurs in the law of mass action. There's the reaction rate. And, you know, the minus says that, you know, I'm losing stuff. 
But of course, that's just x to the y1. So you see, all the monomials that appear really are, are variables. And these are sort of the species variables. And, the, uh, and, and basically just raised to these uh, exponent vectors. Again, those are the ones that tell us how to build complexes out of species. But then this could actually be written in a very nice matrix form. Because notice that, well, I certainly have my uh, you know, a column vector of, uh, of the monomials. And then if I sort of isolate out sort of just the role that the uh, reaction rates play, I get this funky little matrix. And what that is, it's really, so this graph right here, this directed graph, has a uh, weighted graph Laplacian. So when I take this graph, I get this weighted graph Laplacian right here, because, you know, in, in the first Ignore the off-diagonal elements for a second, or the, ignore the diagonal elements. And so, for example, you know, in row one, column two, I have the reaction K12. But of course, you know, there's a, a, a zero here because there's nothing going from one to three. And so it's a zero there. And then, you know, here, you know, I, you know that K21, you know, that's, you know, row two, column one. So this is, you know, exactly the kind of thing you want. And then to get the uh, weighted graph Laplacian, you just uh, use the diagonal entries to make the rows sum to zero. So that's the weighted graph Laplacian. And then what happens is this is its transpose. So that's why you know, the K21 here becomes the K21 here. So here, you know, here the column sums are zero, here the row sums are zero, here the column sums are zero. And then it turns out that what's really nice is when you do this, then there's a third matrix that again uses the, our exponent vectors, and uh, this is called the stoichiometric matrix. And uh, it's basically just the matrix with the y's as the columns. So it's a, it's a very nice factorization. So we're actually going to see in the next slide there really are two different ways that people use to uh, you know, think about you know, how do you write a system of, of equations. So here's the, the general version. So in general, you'll have n species and m complexes. Then you get a weighted directed graph, and the weights are on the edges. And, and the edges and the vertices are the complexes and the weight of a directed edge. And, I, and you see I'm going to use two notations uh, when I talk about rate costs. And sometimes I'll just write them this way, just the uh, index 1, 2. But sometimes I want to emphasize that you know, this is the uh, uh, reaction going from complex I to complex J. And then, so sometimes I put the little arrow there just as a reminder uh, about which way we're going. So I turn, and so we have that. And so basically, for this directed edge, I have a reaction rate. And then, of course, this uh, Y matrix. And basically, the, you know, the columns of this matrix express the complexes in terms of the species. And so we've already seen two. So it turned out here's one way to do it. So it's a sum over all the reactions of the reaction rates times the monomials times the difference of the uh, you know, two vectors involved in the, uh, in the reaction. And an example, so that's the one we saw here. So that's uh, this example right here, because that was the directed graph. So there's only one sum. There's the reaction rate. There's the monomial. And there's the difference of the two uh, exponent vectors. And so, so that's the one we saw. But then the other way that you can package it is uh, this way, where you have our st stoichiometric matrix using the, you know, the y1 through ym as column vectors, then you have this uh, you know, basically transpose of the uh, Laplacian. And uh, although actually, uh, actually I think, uh, I, think I, I might have made a mistake. Yeah, oh, I see. Laplacian puts negatives here. My apologies. So that's the weighted graph Laplacian. So I take the negative of that and transpose it. And so anyway, so here's this uh, uh, second one that w we have. So we have this, this one. And again, you know, phi is going to be the column vector of the uh, uh, monomials. And then in the middle is this uh, thing AK. And that's the, uh, the negative transpose of the Laplacian. And so there the example we saw was this one that, uh, so, so you know, there's the y matrix, 
there's the negative transpose of the graph of Poisson, and there's the uh, column vector of uh, monomials. And we'll see that in different contexts, you know, for some contexts, uh, you know, this way of writing the reaction is uh, extremely informative. In other contexts, this is actually uh, a better way to write it. But it's clear that it's not an arbitrary system of differential equations, and it's got a nice structure to it uh, that we can uh, sort, of, sort of exploit. And so the next thing to talk about is the stoichiometry. I've used that word a couple of times. So there's how to pronounce it, uh, courtesy of Wikipedia. And this is the Wikipedia definition, the relationship between the relative quantities of substances taking part in a reaction. And I read that and said, yeah, it's OK. Not very helpful, actually. And, uh, and it's, it's a usual thing that you, once you see an example, it becomes obvious. So for example, what happens in this reaction is that notice that any time there's this reaction, basically I have two oxygen molecules atoms here, two oxygen atoms here. So I have four oxygen atoms here. After the reaction, I have four oxygen atoms. So that's why I need that two to preserve the oxygen atoms. And similarly, before the reaction takes place, I have two nitrogens. And after the reaction, I have two nitrogens. So basically, those are preserved quantities. And in fact, if you look at these concentrations, you know, if I, again, thinking about uh, molecules uh, per cubic centimeter, and that cubic centimeter, you know, how many nitrogen atoms do I have? Well, each of these contributes one, each of these contributes one, so that's the number of nitrogen atoms. That's unchanged, so that's basically the same. And the zero, of course, just starts, you know, it's the time zero stuff. So you see, this is a uh, conserved quantity. The oxygen atoms, you know, in any cubic centimeter, you know, any molecule of this contributes one, here it contributes two, here it also contributes two. So this is another conserved quantity, so it's whatever I had at the beginning. Now, if you take these conservation things and do a little bit of algebra, what you discover, because remember, these guys are functions of time. And so the idea is that as time goes on, well, here's what I had at time zero. And then if you sort of do a little bit of algebra, what you discover is that uh, this is equal to this. It's going to be s this function times that vector right there. And, uh, and again, just a little bit of algebra to you know, show that you know, this works. And what that shows is that the stoichiometry implies that uh, our reaction involves along the line. So the question is, what's the general picture lurking here. And, uh, and you'll see that it turns out this is actually a vector we've actually uh, seen before. And in fact, this is the vector of coefficients in, in when I write down the differential equations. So, so let, let's see what, uh, what we can say in general about that. You see, there's our vector minus 2 minus 1, 0. Remember, that's just y2 minus y1. So because there's our system. So again, I'm taking the system and writing it in this particular form. And so what that says is that uh, in this system, uh, you know, basically uh, what we have is that, and again, what we have here is that, you know, so, so he, here's the x1, x2, x3. It's the initial stuff plus something in here. And uh, what that means written here, it's basically, you know, and so it was this was equal to this plus a multiple of that. So that says that this is in the initial stuff plus the span of this, which is that. And then, so this is a more general way of saying it. And in fact, it turns out that this statement right here actually determines all the stoichiometry you've seen before. Because suppose I have a vector that's perpendicular to y2 minus y1. Well, if I then take this right here and take its dot product with v, well, v is going to kill that. So that says that v times this, v dot this is v dot that. So that says that any time I'm perpendicular to this uh, y2 minus y1, v dot x is a conserved quantity. And it turns out a basis for the orthogonal complement of uh, this difference are these two vectors. And, uh, and notice when it's that, uh, when, when v is this vector, v dot x is exactly that sum of conserved quantity. And when it's this one, uh, v dot x is that conserved quantity. So these that we sort of found pretty naively just by counting nitrogen and oxygen atoms, in fact, really all flow from this statement right here. 
So, so this is the one we actually have to figure out what it looks like in general, but that's really easy. And, uh, and that's the stoichiometric subspace. Because when we write the equation this way, we'll have you know, multiple reactions. But again, each reaction you know, involves a difference of these two vectors. And that's the vector. Remember that this is yi is the vector at the uh, beginning, and yj is the ve vector at the end. So you know, this is sort of the, the, the reactant, and that's sort of the product kind of uh, stuff. And, and so the stoichiometric subspace is simply the span of all these vectors. And this subspace plays a big role in the theory in multiple ways that we'll see uh, both in this lecture and the next lecture. And again, the point is, is that uh, if I have anything in the orthogonal complement of S, then um, taking the dot product of this with V says that V dot X is a conserved quantity and is equal to that constant right there. And so again, the, uh, so we get completely everything that we had in the previous slide, but now in general. So this leads to the idea of what's called the sto stoichiometric compatibility class. Because remember that not only do we have this statement, but remember that my concentrations are non-negative. So that's a non-negative vector. That's a non-negative vector. So in fact, when I take this fact and combine it with that, I discover that x of t is in this polyhedron. Because you know, here I take a linear subspace. I take a translate. So this is. And so, so this is an actual genuine subspace uh, through the origin. This is a translate of it. And, uh, and then I intersect that with the non-negative orthant. And uh, this is a picture of what it could look like. And so what you get is a, a polyhedron. And it turns out that, remember, a polytope is a bounded polyhedron. So this is a case where it's actually a polytope. But I'll show you an example in the next slide where this, um, where this intersect, where the stoichiometric compatibility classes are actually polyhedra. They, they aren't bounded. And they, they go off to infinity. And so, so that's sort of, so basically, this is where you know, the action takes place when you're solving some of these systems. And so that means the next thing to look at is the steady state solutions, because that's the one we're interested in. So again, here's sort of the, all the stuff we have to keep in mind. And I should point out that I'm presenting this as a, a weighted directed graph, where the weights consist of uh, the reaction rates on the edges. And uh, that really should, yeah. And, uh, and, but the thing is that you really, what in some presentations, because remember that this uh, stoichiometric uh, uh, vectors, the yi's, they're attached to the vertices. And so sometimes you'll actually see this with, is a graph that's sort of two weightings. One is a weighting on the uh, edges, where you just put the reaction rates. But you also put weights on the uh, vertices. And that's basically the vector uh, yi that's at each vertex. And, uh, and then we have this you know, negative transpose Laplacian and this guy. So that's our terminology. And again, here are the two different ways of writing what we have. And basically, you know, and this is just standard stuff, a steady state or equilibrium solution. It's where the concentration vector is constant. And uh, so basically, that means that when you, you know, uh, plug this in, you get 0. <coughs> And so that means you have this, but this is a system of polynomial equations. And of course, this is why you know, algebraic geometry starts to be relevant. And, um, and so we actually have this steady state variety. And uh, it's the variety defined by this, or you can think of it as you know, defined by these polynomials. And it lives in Rn. But of course, the physical meaning, so this is basically a real uh, algebraic variety. But, so we're doing real algebraic geometry. But you know, right here, of course, in the physical world, we only want the non-negative solutions. And this, of course, we're now in the land of semi-algebraic geometry. And so th this is really where the interest is uh, in terms of uh, you know, trying to you know, relate the mathematics to the chemistry. Now, the, the, oops. So let me do two, uh, two examples and, um, and just work out the, some steady states. And, um, and uh, th th these are very simple examples. And so you know, that's our first system we started with. And so the steady states where these are 0, you know, my reaction rate is positive, so that just says that. And so what that means is that the steady state is where one or the other of these is 0. In other words, the reaction runs until you run out of stuff. And it stops whenever you, the first one goes to 0. And this is sort of an extinction kind of uh, behavior. And a lot of re chemical reactions actually work this way, and that's really what you want. 
And, uh, but another thing that can happen is, uh, remember when I took this one and teased it apart, we got this reaction right here, this reversible reaction. And, um, and in this case, when you write down the law of mass action, you get you know, the, the, you know, the rate of change of this one is this, the rate of change of that one is that, and, uh, or, or, uh, of the O2. And, uh, and, yeah, so let's see. So there's something messed up here. So I, I, yeah, so I think there's a, a typo there that uh, I, I need to think about. But, uh, but anyway, the, you know, when you have, uh, you know, in the steady state, um, yeah, so, so let, let, ignore that one, please. I, so th th that's clearly nonsense because O2 is not involved in this. So, so a, a new version might be posted Monday. It, it, might, might, be, uh, it might, I mean, I have to think about this slide. There might be newer versions. That's right, that's right, that's right. And, uh, uh, but the point is, if I just look at this one, so this one I know is, is, is correct. And, uh, and what happens here is uh, the steady state is when that's zero, and so that says these two quantities are equal. So that's the, where that uh, equation came from that I showed you earlier for the steady state. And, uh, and notice that this is, this is sort of a slightly naive, but you know, this does define a toric variety. And uh, you know, if I regard those as variables, and so that's one question is, you know, I, I talked about torque dynamo systems. Is this is this an artifact of this case, or is this something more general? And we'll see. We'll see. this is in a sense this is an unusually simple situation. And the equation, the steady state equations are usually more complicated. We'll see an example in a second. So the fact that this one is toric is it's a very special system that makes this happen. But uh, what? Uh, but uh, we'll see that there are torque varieties uh, definitely relevant. That'll be in the second lecture. And so here's a more complicated. Hey, what? I think I know your typo. Uh, o2 should be just N2O2 instead yeah. of O2. Yeah. N2O2. Oh, yeah. Oh, good. So, the, the, so, oh, so that means it's an easy one to fix. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Oh, that, that, that's excellent. That's excellent. So there's still way to be a new version, but I think I can make that change before Monday. <laughs> Great. Good, good. And so, yeah. And so, uh, but here's a more complicated system. Now, this is no longer a chemical system. This is really a biochemical system, because what are interacting are not uh, you know, molecules, but cells. But notice that this is the same language of, you know, you know, we have a T cell and a virus, and they, you know, and, and they interact, and that causes basically more T cells to be made, or you know, a T cell and a virus interact, and you know, that, that causes an infected T cell. So you know, we have this system right here, and then each one has a reaction rate. And then remember what we did is that uh, you know, we, had the, you know, we had the variables that we set up, you know, and then, then we had the differential equations, and the point is, is that now this really is the law of mass action you know, applied to this system. And so we now see that this really does come from what we want. And notice that in this case, we have five species and we have eight complexes. And so we, uh, you know, so it's a definitely a much more complicated system. But you can still ask about steady states. You can still ask, like, does extinction happen, stuff like that. So you have the same kinds of questions. And, uh, and that's where, you know, we, so again, this is just re reproducing a slide from earlier. And remember, in this case, you know, when we took the steady state variety and decomposed it, it had two components. And one did have some extinction stuff, where some of the, <coughs> where some of the variables would go to uh, zero. But then we had this other one that was, you know, had some steady state solutions where, you know, things would just be there in constant amounts uh, in your system. And so, you know, this is the one that was actually, uh, you, know, uh, you know, biologically interesting. And, and so uh, some general questions you can ask, and of course, in the steady state variety, you're always interested in the non-negative part of it. And, uh, and then, of course, if I have a, one of these uh, non-negative steady states, then it has a stoichiometric uh, compatibility class. And so there's a couple of questions you can ask. So for example, when I look at a stoichiometric compatibility class, you know, maybe here's one thing. Does it contain other steady states? 
So the question is, you know, how big is this intersection? And it turns out that, you know, for example, if it has more than one steady state, that's the phenomenon of multistationarity. And you know, there's a lot of work on, on that. That, you know, for example, uh, you know, one of the posters uh, that we have deals with uh, multistationarity. And in fact, in fact, three of the posters, uh, the last three uh, that I put on the board, all deal with chemical uh, reaction. So CRNT is chemical reaction network theory. And, uh, and, and, and so, so one question is, you know, how many do you have? And notice that in some cases, it depends on the initial conditions. Because remember, what determines the stoichiometric compatibility class are the initial conditions. And so you know, for some initial conditions, there's a unique steady state. For other initial conditions, there's more than one. But then also, when you have a, uh, a steady state, one question is, you know, is it locally attracting? And, and so, you know, for example, if I take, you know, another, if I take some initial condition that start to close to the steady state in the same uh, compatibility class, and if it's close by, you know, does it approach this as time goes to infinity? So that's the idea of locally attracting. Or you could ask a stronger thing, is it globally attracting? That if you take you know any initial condition in the steady state, does it do? And so and so there's basically uh, you know it just and, and of course these are questions in dynamical systems that people ask about this stuff. And so this is where sort of the algebraic geometry shades off into the d dynamical systems. But before I say a little more, I want to talk about a bit about the people that uh, sort of uh, helped create this theory. And so, the, so Fritz Horn, Roy Jackson, and Martin Feinberg are some of the uh, key players. And basically, the bulk of the theory was created in this sort of uh, you know, period of just a bit over 20 years. The thing that surprised me is they're actual chemical engineers. They weren't you know, the laboratory chemists that uh, you, you sort of think of. And, uh, and in chemical engineering, when I was in college, I had a roommate who was in chemical engineering. And he kept talking about stirred tanks. And that's a stirred tank. And so, so this is where the chemistry happens in a big. Sea stars in chemical engineering. Sea star. Continuous stirred tank reactors. That's right. And so, uh, and so the idea is that you have this tank with some stuff in it. And so then you see reactant goes in. And then you have a, a stirrer to you know, help move things along somehow. And then you know, sometimes you, know, you, you, know, you have to vent stuff. And, um, and then, then the products overflow. So the idea is that stuff goes in, the reaction happens, stuff comes out, and that's the stuff you want. And what's interesting is this part right here, that's the coolant. That's actually important, because I've been assuming that these reaction rates are constant. What happens is the reaction rate depends on the temperature. There's something called the Arrhenius law. So for example, at absolute zero, the reaction rates go to zero. And, you know, there's not much chemistry at absolute zero. And that's where the funky physics takes over. And so the idea is that you know, basically, to, for things to move nicely, you want to sort of keep stuff at a constant temperature. So they have to sort of, yeah, you know, they, so I have to know a fair amount of chemistry, a lot of chemistry to you know, make, you know, how, cool, how much cooling do you have to do? Because if, if you cool it, too much, well, you'll, you'll slow the reaction down too much. But if you don't cool it enough, the reaction will go faster than you want. And then so, so you clearly have to know what you're doing to make this stuff work. Well, also, some kind of reactions create a lot of heat. That's right. That's right. So you want, yeah, that's, yeah, that's right. And, and, and so you, you want to, you have to remove some of that. And, uh, and then what happens, for example, uh, you know, you know, sometimes you see reactions look like this, which looks like you're getting something out of nothing. And how do, how do you do that? Well, what happens, in, see, that's where you're adding the reactants. And so, so in a chemical engineering context, you know, this actually can make sense because of the stuff going in. And of course, in a biological system, you know, the body creates cells. And also here, of course, I'm removing stuff. And, uh, and of course, in a biological system, where cells, cells can die. And, and, and so even though these look sort of funky from a sort of chemical point of view, in the context that people use them, they make sense. Now, it turns out that I was an undergraduate at Rice from uh, 1966 to 1970. And what's interesting is that Rice has a math department and a department of mathematical sciences. And I was in the math department. And uh, it turns out, completely unaware to me, Horn and Jackson were actually at Rice at the same time. 
But I was in my, you know, seriously pure math phase. You know, I, I, I took no statistics, I took no differential <laughs> equations, you know, anything applied, nothing. In fact, I didn't even take chemistry. And it turns out I was in the uh, BS, uh, my, my degree is a BS, Bachelor of Science, and so chemistry is a required course. So I almost didn't graduate. I actually had to petition some committee, you know, saying, hey, I didn't take chemistry, please let me graduate. They were nice, it happened. And, and so the fact that, and so not only was I clueless about these guys, I was also clueless about that. So the fact that here I am lecturing about these guys on this subject, you know, 50 years later, it's, it's, it's one of the wonderful ironies that can happen. And so for the young people, all I can say is that your career can go in unexpected directions and, and just enjoy it. <laughs> And so, so what do I want to do in the, in the rest of the lecture? And so I basically want to talk about this uh, deficiency zero theorem. And so basically, a chemical reaction network is complex balanced. So I have to define what that is. And I want it to be complex balanced for every set of positive reaction rates. And we see that's a pretty strong condition. And the theorem says that that's if and only if it has deficiency zero and weakly reversible. And so, uh, so what I need to do is explain all those terms. And then in the next lecture, I'm going to basically eventually explain this deficiency zero term uh, theorem in terms of toric geometry. And, uh, and then one hint is that uh, in 2009, these complex balance systems got a new name called toric dynamical systems courtesy of a paper of Kreiken, Dickenstein, Sue, and Sturmfels, and of course, Alicia and Ann are in the audience today. And, um, and, and so we, it's clear that this is an interesting theorem in its own right, but it's also gonna be, in my view, even more interesting when we sort of you know, view it through the lens of, a, of, toric, of sort of toric geometry. But that's the next lecture, so we have to talk about this complex balancing stuff. So remember the uh, idea that uh, we have is that you know the vertices you know, of, of of our you know weighted graph are the m complexes, and I'll just you know call them generically C1 to Cn, and then an edge is a reaction. And now suppose I have so I'm not going to think very broadly. I'm not going to think chemistry anymore. I'm just going to think broadly of a. Uh, the system supported on this weighted directed graph. And suppose I just have some stuff uh, at each complex. So I, again, I'm not thinking in terms of chemistry or you know, amounts or anything. I have just some, some amount of something at each complex. Well, then I can think about what's the inflow? Because you know, stuff is flowing through this uh, you know, network. And so basically, what's the inflow at C? Well, it's all the uh, edges that point into L. What's the inflow at L? It's all the uh, edges that point into L. And so I, I take that, and I just basically take this in times the reaction rate. So that's sort of you know, a naively, what, what's the inflow? Then, of course, I have the outflow, and that clearly comes from all edges that start from this complex and go out. And so that's the stuff flowing out. And of course, it's balanced if and only if the inflow is equal to the outflow at every complex. And uh, what you get is uh, you know, an equation that looks like this at every uh, 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 complex. And then when you sort of write that down using, and remember this is the uh, you know, negative transpose of the graph Laplacian, what you discover, you just get this balancing equation. That when I take you know, whatever these funky quantities are in each one, for this to be balanced from the point of view of the complexes, it's the graph Laplacian times these quantities is the zero vector. So that's complex balancing. So that's pretty good. Now let's talk about an example of a complex balanced network. And uh, so suppose I have this uh, system of reactions. So you know I have, uh, so in this case I have four complexes. That's my usual convention for labeling the uh, reaction rates. You know, and here I have, you know, if this reaction is reversible, that just means I have the arrow going the other way, similarly this one. And if I look at the, uh, and when I talk about strong linkage classes, well, that's really just how the chemists talk about connected components of a directed graph. 
And so, for example, this is a connected component as a directed graph because, you know, from any uh, vertex, I can get to any other vertex by a directed path. Similarly, this is a connected component. And this edge doesn't lie in any connected component when you think of it as a directed graph. So I just have these, and then so, like I said, in the chemistry literature, they call these, you know, uh, strong linkage classes. But if I look at the balancing equations, well, at C1, you know, I need, the, uh, I need the inflow to equal the outflow, and so that's the balancing equation at C1. If I look at C2, the inflow, well, the only inflow I get is from C1, but now I have two bits of outflow because I can go this way or that way, so I get that. And if I compare that equation to that equation, I discover that, and of course, I also get inflow, outflow here, and a similar thing here. So I actually get four equations. These are just the first two. But these first two clearly imply that, uh, you know, that uh, the amount at C1 and the amount at C2 have to be zero, just because of, you know, comparing this part, that says the C2 has to be zero, and then from that you get the C1 is zero, because again, all the rate constants are positive numbers. And of course, if you think about it, this makes intuitive sense because you can sort of imagine stuff cycling around here and stuff cycling around here, but the stuff cycling around here, part of it is draining out. And so eventually you expect that eventually it's all going to drain out and you're just left with stuff cycling around here. And, uh, and, and, and so basically this middle reaction says that the left cycle will eventually drain into the right two cycle. And this right two cycle is what's called a terminal strong linkage class. And it's terminal because it has no outward arrows. It might have some arrows uh, coming that involve in it, but they all are inward arrows. And so it's sort of a sink from that, from that point of view. And then the idea is that I haven't actually defined a complex balanced network. That's the next thing. So a complex balanced network. So now I'm talking about from the chemical reaction point of view. And so here I want a steady state solution. So I want that. So what is this steady state solution complex balance? And the idea is that I want something that sort of satisfies the balancing condition. So I want this. So, you know, basically, here I was talking about some, you know, you know, funky thing to put at each complex. Well, what I'm going to put is just, you know, the monomial, the appropriate monomial in my steady state solution. So when I put that at each uh, complex, it's balanced. So that means that this is, so in fact, in not only do I solve that equation, I solve that one. So that's the first part of being a complex balanced network. And the second is that I want, I want, this to involve the whole network. So I don't want something where the uh, balanced solution only involves part of it. And so I, I want basically all of the entries to be positive. So this right here is, cannot be a complex balanced network because uh, you know, any, uh, you know, any uh, balancing solution puts zeros here. So I, I, want, I need something that can have a balancing solution that's all positive, and in fact, it actually comes from you know, my steady state solution. Because remember that the entries of this are sort of uh, monomials uh, in this to, you know, to the y1 to, to yn. And so that's a complex balanced solution. And it turns out that there's at least a necessary condition that you need in order to have such a solution. So here when I, talk, when I say the word connected component, I'm really just going to be talking about the uh, underlying uh, undirected graph. And so I, I'm ignoring the direction of the arrows. And so here are some equivalent statements. So, uh, so every connected component, just in the classical sense, is strongly connected, and that means connected as a directed graph. You can get from any edge to any other edge by a directed path. And so basically, so here where the connected components coincide with the uh, strongly connected components. And that's equivalent to saying that every complex lies in a terminal strong linkage class. And that's also equivalent to saying that for any one direction, that I can basically, if I have a reaction going from CI to CJ, well, I can get from CJ back to CI not by a single reaction, but by a sequence of reactions that are in the graph. And so this is, and this is really what, where the term weakly reversible comes in, because reversible would just say that if I have this reaction, I have a reaction going instantly the other way. Weakly reversible says I, can, I sort of have a sequence of reactions going the other way. And so a weakly reversible uh, network is one that satisfies any of these three conditions. So of course, this guy is not weakly reversible because the whole graph is connected, 
but it has two uh, strongly connected components, these uh, you know, strong linkage classes. Whereas here's a weakly reversible one, and uh, notice the, the whole graph is not connected. So a weakly reversible doesn't have to be connected, but you know, here's you know, one uh, you know, uh, you know, strong linkage uh, uh, component. And then here, you know, the point is, is that you know, here this reaction, so each of these reactions is uh, clearly, rever each reverses the other. But you know, this one is weakly reversible, because if I want to go the other, if I, if I want to, you know, this one goes this way, if I want to go the other direction, I just go from D to here down to here. Similarly, this one, I can reverse this one by going from here up to here. So this is a weakly reversible network, whereas that one isn't. And, uh, and so basically, it, it, so, so if I talk about a complex balanced network, uh, the question, you know, I can immediately rule out this one. And so here the question is, you know, could I actually have a, uh, you know, a, a, a positive steady state uh, that, you know, of uh, this one. And so here it, it's an open question. And what we'll discover is that whether or not you can do it sometimes depends on what the reaction rates are. So that's going to be interesting. And, and, so, and so in fact, let me actually prove that complex balanced implies weakly reversible. Because I, I asserted that on the, in the, when I talked about the previous slide, let's actually prove it. And uh, so here we have our chemical reaction network. It has a positive steady state. That, so when I take these monomials of that positive steady state, it satisfies the balancing conditions. So that, and, and remember, the balancing conditions are made by taking the steady state to my various exponent vectors. And so, but notice that if this is positive, well, these are just monomials in, in the, uh, you know, in, in the components of this. So this is also positive. But it turns out that what we're going to see in, in the next lecture is that the kernel of this graph Laplacian is actually supported on the terminal strong linkage classes. Turns out that's a consequence of the matrix tree theorem. So once you understand the matrix tree theorem, that tells you sort of when, when you look at the kernel of the graph Laplacian, you know where it's supported. But I, but the point is, and so that means, but this is a positive solution, and so that means that the terminal strong linkage classes have to be everybody. So that means that, uh, and so because this has positive entries, every complex belongs to a strong terminal linkage class. That's one of the equivalent conditions on the previous slide, and so I get weak reversibility. And so that's why you have this kind of condition. But again, the converse is not true. And, uh, and, we'll, and again, sometimes that'll depend on what the rate constants actually are. So let me state the deficiency as zero theorem. And so, because that, that's going to be the last thing we talk about today. So we have this stoichiometric uh, subspace. And so this was defined by Feinberg, Martin Feinberg in 1972. And so the deficiency of a chemical reaction network, it's basically uh, this little formula. So it's called delta. And uh, so M is the number of complexes. And then here, L is the number, just the number of uh, connected components of the underlying graph. And then uh, S is the uh, dimension of the uh, st stoichiometric subspace of S. And, uh, and remember, the stoichiometric subspace of S, that's the one that's involved in these stoichiometric uh, compatibility classes. And so you take these three numbers, form that little combination. So here's the theorem that I actually stated earlier, that uh, a chemical reaction network is complex balanced. And I want to be complex balanced for every set of positive reaction rates. And that is equivalent to saying it has deficiency zero and is weakly reversible. And like I say, this was one of the first really interesting results to come out of this theory. And, and, and it said that in some cases, sort of you have some interesting stuff. And it turns out that it, when this happens, so, so what does this say? That if you have deficiency zero and weakly reversible, it says you have this complex balance solution. And remember, that means a, uh, a, 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 you have one positive solution that, uh, you know, where the, the corresponding phi uh, vector uh, satisfies the balancing equation. But it turns out that has a lot of consequences. And so here's some consequences that, all, that uh, you, know, you know, Horn, Jackson, and Feinberg worked out that in, in this condition, suppose I take any rate constants in any stoichiometric compatibility class. Because, you know, the, so, so the picture you might have would be, uh,
So you have these very stoichiometric compatibility classes. And so right here, so, so by hypothesis, is that. So, so you know, it's a positive solution, and you know, when I take the vector of uh, monomials, it satisfies the balancing equations. And so, so that's what we assume. So what is the, uh, and, 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 and this is, and, 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 then, uh, and then what do we have is that uh, we have that, uh, now take any rate, and this might be for one set of rate constants. Now I take a totally different set of rate constants, I take a totally different stoichiometric compatibility class, then it turns out that in this different one, there's a unique steady state solution. And furthermore, that steady state solution is complex balanced and it's locally attractive. And furthermore, it's, there's a conjecture that, in fact, in this situation, it's actually globally attracting. And that's the global attractor conjecture. And, uh, and, and so, so just the fact, you know, and so again, this you know, little simple theorem, you know, you know, it, it looks like it says, oh, I have an interesting solution. But then you find out you know, lots of information about all the solutions. So let's go back to this guy right here. So this is the one that we started with. And, uh, and we, we commented this guy's weakly reversible. And, and here's the uh, stoichiometric uh, uh, matrix. Because you know, remember that here there's you know, three complexes and, and basically five species, A through E. And notice that this one is built from the first and the third. So that's why that's that vector. This is just the uh, fourth. That's why it's that vector. And so these are the y1, y2, y3. And, um, and, and so let's compute the deficiency. So you know, it's the number of complexes, three. L is just the number of connected components. It's one. And uh, it's weakly reversible. And, uh, and then, so what's the stoichiometric uh, compatibility space? Well, again, for E, so there's basically four uh, reactions. And so I have to take the four corresponding differences. But notice that in this case, you know, because these just go the opposite direction, this guy's just a negative of that guy. So it means I can actually uh, dispense with this one. So I, so I don't need the uh, uh, second one. And also notice that if I add the uh, last two, the y3s cancel, and I'm left with just the first one. So I don't need the first one. So in fact, the span is just those two that were literally independent. So in fact, the deficiency is number of complexes, connected components, dimension of the stoichiometric compatibility space. So the deficiency theorem applies. And so I know all this astonishing stuff just from this little calculation. So that's sort of the power of, of, of the theory. So what I've hoped I've uh, convinced you is that, first of all, it's actually possible to understand this terminology. It's, you know, it, it takes a while to get used to, and, uh, but you know, it's not bad. We actually have some vague sense about what stoichiometry means, but I suspect if we talk to, to chemists about this, they just laugh at us. But, uh, but still, we, we know enough to read about it and uh, you know, talk about it. And, and for example, you, you, you can tell a dean, oh, I, I study systems that involve stoichiometry. That'll make you look smart. <laughs> and, uh, and we talked about Until complex. Until he asks the next question. What? Until he asks a follow-up question. Well, yeah. depends on the D. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, and then and we you know, talked about uh, you know, zero deficiency theorem, which is, again, one of the classic results uh, of the basic theory. So what we're going to do uh, in, next, in the next hour is talk about toric dynamical systems that revisit the zero deficiency from the toric context and see that it actually really makes sense, and then talk about the pioneering work of Karen Gottman. So that, that's the plan for uh, uh, after coffee. So thank you. So any questions? So it's not necessarily the case that we need complex balance for the species to be in a steady state, right? Like if for the matrix Y, if that has, if that's singular, we somehow end up in its kernel. Yeah. So. Yeah. So yeah. So so wait, so remember so remember that to be a steady state. 
Yeah, so, 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 so what happens, yeah, so remember, a steady state solution is when you have this, and what that means, so a steady state solution means that this vector is in the kernel of Y. And, and, that, and that could happen without this actually being zero already. So is, is that what you were asking? Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. And if what I will do is, uh, and uh, in the next lecture, I'll show some classic examples of uh, systems where uh, sort of the generic behavior is that this is non-zero, and uh, you know, no matter what you try. But then if you uh, you basically make a, a good choice of the uh, um, rate constants, uh, this actually does happen. And that good choice, of course, is going to be some algebraic equations. And then, in fact, we're going to actually have a, a moduli space for the toric dynamical systems. Yeah? So suppose we fix a uh, stoichiometric compatibility class. Yeah. But uh, due to some byproduct of the reaction, it's producing heat, or it's pumping ions into the solution, the activity coefficient is changing. Do we know how that perturbs the uh, steady state? And the answer is, somebody might know, but it's certainly not me. <laughs> um, do you know what's been, what's been done in the case of non-integer rate uh, laws? Well, where, they, uh, where, where the exponent vectors aren't integer. Right. And, and again, the answer is no. Okay. I mean, some of the results hold in that case, because yes. it's sort of a result. Yes, in some, some cases, it's just easy to do, but right. yeah, others it might not be. Like, like I, I think like there's a uniqueness there of the, the, the George Gratian had his thesis it holds with irrational exponents. Right, right. So, 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 so at least George explained to me um, that these reaction rates are, are not very well known. Right. They're only approximate. And that's right. one, and so this partially answers that previous question. So, so they, they look for results that are true for all, all of them, or all of them in a reasonable range because of that. Right, right. So, so, so that's... Yeah, I think Alicia's going to say more about uh, the fact that we don't know the reaction rates. They're, all, they're also really crazy. I, I remember Karen Gutterman talking about this in the late 90s. Yeah. She explained that these, these can be extremely small numbers, or extremely large numbers, and, 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 and there's, no, there's no easy way to rescale the equations so that, so, so, so that, so that they become reasonable. Right. The standard way to deal with polynomial equations numerically mm -hmm. is to find rescaling of the variables so the coefficients become reasonable but, they, but you couldn't get them to be any you know any any small range of magnitudes yeah you know, my, my introduction to this problem was in the in 2004 i taught a course on mathematical modeling in the environment and i wanted to make a simple model of ozone production and you could actually write find the equations that sort of you know, control ozone production. And, uh, and I wanted to actually run it in Mathematica, but I need the rate constant. I just couldn't find it. And uh, it, it was very frustrating. And, and, and again, part of the idea is that they're not known. And so that's why they actually like the, uh, so in a sense, that's, uh, again, one reason why they, uh, oh, let's see. Yeah. You know, that, that, so that's one reason why you know, they like the fact of the deficiency zero theorem because it works for all possible reaction rates, so you don't need to worry about it. So other questions?